Hi, this is Jeff Schneider, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm joined by Jeff Schneider, an award-winning composer and music educator whose YouTube videos for saxophone and piano, online courses, and blog and email lessons are helping musicians around the world to wrap their head around everything from equipment to technique to music theory and listening skills. In this conversation, we cover a ton of interesting topics, including sight reading, improvisation, what makes for effective practicing, and the entrepreneurial requirements of being a professional musician today. Jeff shares how many hours a day he practiced growing up, one activity that was central, and the one thing he thinks is essential to practice effectively. He shares one resource he's found really useful to help him balance his creativity with the desire to make a living as a musician. Plus, Jeff shares several punchy tips on improvisation, sight reading, jazz, and rhythm. I know you'll enjoy this one, and it'll inspire you to check out Jeff's website and sign up for his email list. And don't miss the unforgettable name that email list has. We talk about it towards the end of the interview. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Christopher. Great to be here. So I have a sense of who you are as a musician these days from your fantastic YouTube channel, but I don't know all that much about your backstory. And I'd love to know what was your early music education like? How did you get started and become the saxophonist and pianist and educator that you are today? Well, if we go to the very beginning, my family is a very musical family. Both my parents played classical piano and my sister's into musical theater. Um, my brother plays classical piano, piano and guitar. I was sort of the one that was like very interested in just learning how to play by ear. So I didn't have that traditional sort of grow up with the piano, doing classical lessons. I never really took to that. I was just kind of figuring out how to play movie uh, movie themes on the piano. So we'd watch a movie as a family, and then I'd go over to the piano and figure out how to play that by ear. My my dad taught me about uh, you know basic chords and inversions and how to make that work. So you know from the very beginning, I was I was really interested, okay, how do I get my ear stronger? Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of kids, they grew up just running through scales and playing classical pieces. And I think there's a lot of merit to that as well, but that wasn't really my, uh, my early background. Um, going on from there, I started playing saxophone in middle school, which was a little bit later than some of the other, uh, the other kids. I think um, most, most of the students were starting in fourth grade, but I was in seventh grade. And you know, it was, it was fun. I was again, you know, kind of just messing around, noodling, figuring out how to, figuring out how to play things by ear. And then, uh, in high school was when I really started to get obsessed with practicing and playing music. And from, you know, there on out, it was just like really my obsession. And that's all I wanted to do was, was make music all the time. That's really interesting. I don't think there are many high school students who would say they were obsessed with practicing. <laughs> that sounds unusual. Tell us where that attitude came from. Well. You know, it was a combination of, you know, there were some musicians that were older than me in school that I really looked up to. And I actually, there was this moment where I read this interview. It was with Charlie Parker, and I think Paul Desmond was conducting the interview. And in it, Charlie Parker talks about how he practiced for like 15 hours a day for three years. And I just thought that was, you know, ridiculous. But I was <laughs> like, wow, uh, that kind of made something click in my head was, and, and that was, if I just work hard enough, I'll be able to get to that level. So I started putting in as many hours as I could. And there was like a, a summer I remember distinctly after I think freshman year in high school or sophomore year in high school. And I practiced like eight hours a day all summer. And it was clear when I came back to school that the following uh, semester, there was such an improvement in my playing. And it, it was just a, a real um, affirmation that, uh, that the practicing paid off and that the hard work paid off. I have a couple of questions there. I guess the first is whether you have any observations on the environment you'd grown up in or your school's attitude to music that let you 
be so positive about that idea of practicing so much. You know, I, I'm sure there's a personality aspect to it, but I, I know there's also a lot of music education where the practicing is so dull and the payoff so intangible that people really struggle. Like even if they're excited to get to the end goal, there's very few who actually follow through and do a lot of practice at that age. Yeah. Uh, after teaching for a long time too, I, I've kind of uh, gotten to see both sides of, of the coin there, how some students are just so engaged in, in getting better and, and have the drive to to sit through the more boring exercises because they know that on the other end of that, they're going to see some real res results. Um, whereas, you know, there's plenty of kids out there who just don't want to, you know, go through the hard times to get to the good times, which is, you know, understandable. That's sort of human nature. So a lot of it, like you said, I think is personality. Um, but everything just kind of excited me. And I, I was just so into it at the time and still am for that matter. But at a young age, I was so into it that, like I said, I was able to kind of push through exercises that would make some people go crazy. And, you know, I'm sure made my parents go crazy when I was, <laughs> you know, practicing all hours of the night. Uh, but to me, it was just like so much fun and awesome. So uh, yeah, I guess it, I, I, I do think it's a personality thing, but there, there are also, you know, like you were, uh, you know, kind of alluding to the, the school system that I was in, s music was very much supported. We had a good music program in my high school so, you know, my, my band director gave me a lot of opportunity and, you know, encouraged me. And I think that does have a lot to do with it as well. And my parents, of course, you know, the same kind of thing, very supportive. They would let me practice when I wanted to, which oftentimes was in the middle of the night. So, uh, you know, it was, um, I had the, the right environment to put that kind of work into it. Terrific. And you touched a couple of times there on the second thing I wanted to ask you about in that, which was what that practicing looked like you know you made a reference there to boring exercises and endless drills and maybe we could just take that summer where you were practicing eight hours a day if you can cast your mind back what did that look like and and how did you know how to spend eight hours or did you know how to spend eight hours fruitfully yeah that's a great question and i think you know boring is in the eyes of the beholder right you know some things are going to be exciting to some people and others uh will find it boring but you know i i had this distinct memory of taking this charlie parker lick because i had just gotten the omni book the uh the transcriptions of many of charlie parker's solos and i would take lines in the omni book and just transpose them into all 12 keys uh just little bebop licks and i would force myself to see how fast I could do it, like go from one key to the next and do it up to tempo. And uh, those are the types of exercises that I practiced, a lot of trans uh, transposition. And that was just something that I heard, you know, from random people at like a music store or, you know, I had a great uh, teacher my sophomore year of high school. Um, Will Vinson is this alto saxophonist, uh, amazing player and, and a fantastic teacher. And, um, you know, he would, he would tell me to do things in other keys as well. So I just took whatever I could find and transposed it. And that made a big difference. Gotcha. That's really interesting. And I think it, it fills in a little bit because I think you talk to people who kind of taught themselves by ear and you talk to people in the jazz world who are like, of course you should play everything at all 12 keys, but somewhere along the line, you need to wrap your head around what that means. And particularly, I think if you are more an ear player than a sheet music player, that's not always easy to do. So it's interesting to hear that was a, a big part of your practice there. Yeah, that was probably one of the things that got my understanding of scales and chords, uh, that, that theory knowledge, that's what got it together. Because as I said, I was sort of coming up as an ear player and um, the act of transposing forces you to really know your scales well, to really know your chords well. So uh, I think what it also does is it helps you internalize on an aural level, whatever it is you're working on. Because whenever you hear something so many times in different keys, I think it helps you internalize whatever it is that you're, you're playing. So it does come out uh, both on a sort of a left brain and a right brain uh, side. Mm. And so it sounds like sax was your main focus at that point. Were you still playing some piano? I was still, I was always playing uh, piano, just kind of messing around. Com I would uh, compose on the piano. I was also playing guitar uh, quite a bit. I had this sort of Stevie Ray Vaughan blues phase uh, a little bit before I started really getting into saxophone. So genre wise, I was spread a little bit out there. Um, but yeah, by, by that time when I was doing the, 
epic saxophone practicing sessions. It was definitely primarily sax uh, at that point. Gotcha. And you clearly had some inspiration about the kind of music you wanted to play or the kind of musician you wanted to be. During that period, were there any kind of rewards or kind of results of your labor that kind of kept you motivated because you know for our listeners motivation is often a big thing it's one thing to you know get really psyched about learning a new skill and put in a week or two but to keep you going over time often having some kind of outlet or some kind of event or some kind of sub goal can really help keep you passionate and so I was just wondering you know for you was it like okay now I'm going to work for 10 years and become a professional or were you kind of seeing some payoff from all of that hard work along the way um, I definitely noticed results in terms of, uh, you know, how the practicing was paying off. But at the same time, I would play concerts at school and just be so self-critical that I would, you know, want to want to quit because it was I was really self-critical at the same time. So I think actually what motivated me the most was getting the opportunity to play with other people, especially people who are close to my age, because you know if I was if I was uh, playing with somebody who was around my age, who's playing, I really thought was great. That would push me to, to want to get my playing better because you can kind of see what's possible. It's like, you know, if you hear, if you hear a great player, who's 30 years older than you, yeah, that's, that's fun to listen to. But at the same time, it's like, oh yeah, that guy's like, or gal's 30 years older than me. It's makes a lot of sense that they can play like that. You know, whereas if you if you go to hear someone or play with somebody who's closer to your age, you know where I'm going with this, and they actually have those skills that you want. You're like, wow, I I really got to get it together here because I could be doing more. So that was real big motivation for me going to like uh, music camps during the summer and uh, you know regional whatever they call them, like all state, all that kind of stuff, um, uh, local competitions, that sort of thing. Cool. And so did you have a sense of what you wanted to do after high school? And if so, was that what panned out? Yeah, I think by the time I started doing those epic practice sessions, I was convinced that I was going to just go to music school and uh, music conservatory and just become a professional musician um, to, you know, really, uh, and my my parents were amazingly supportive uh, with that, even though I'm sure they were sort of... uh, scared quite a bit but i was you know i I have a very obsessive personality and and they uh they were i I don't even know what the word is i just had my son i don't i don't know if i would send him to music school but um (laughs) they uh they they agreed to have me go and and it all worked out you know i i love what i do now i get to be a professional musician whatever that means and um and it all worked out Nice. And you say there, be a professional musician, whatever that means. And it's something that's come up a few times on the podcast that whatever realm of music you're in, it's not a clear cut job description, right? It's very few musicians who just do one thing to support themselves through music. So I'd, I'd love if you could share a little bit about what that journey has looked like for you and how you've approached becoming a professional musician from the point of, okay, now I'm a good player. How do you then get to the point where you're like, great, I'm paying my bills. This is my living. I am a musician. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad you, you pointed that out. Like I, I intentionally wanted to try to keep that open-ended at, in, in terms of not defining what it is to be a professional musician. Cause as you said, uh, the word journey, that's so key. It's, you know, in my case, and I think just about everybody's case Rarely is there a point where things are static and you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again um, in this field. It's my job and my way of of making a living has been constantly evolving uh, over time. I've I've taught uh, little kids, I've taught older people, I've taught uh, beginners and more advanced players. I've composed uh, for commercials and advertising and television. Um, it's been such a wide variety of work that I've sort of shifted in and out of that. It's been, it's been a journey. And I think one of the, one of the, I guess, secrets there is just to keep your eyes open and keep thinking about ways of, uh, of evolving. And if you get too comfortable, you know, it's really possible. This happened, you know, recently with, uh, with the job market, I guess, I don't know how recently, but, um, Right where a, a lot of people started losing their jobs because uh, 
everything was changing so much. And that I guess what I'm trying to say is the model of getting a gig and having it for 40 to 60 years or whatever, and then retiring is just not the way it is anymore. So especially if you're going to be a musician where you're essentially an entrepreneur and a business owner, in order to do that successfully, you need to think like an entrepreneur and a business owner and uh, not just like, oh, I got to go get a job. Yeah, that's not the way to be successful. Interesting. And I, I want to circle back and talk in a moment about the mindset of an entrepreneur and, and what you've learned on that side. But if you don't mind, first, one thing that I think is really notable about you and the career you have built for yourself is creativity is still at the heart of it. I think, you know, a lot of people go the educational route and they may be extremely good teachers, but they lose that opportunity to perform or compose or arrange or create in their own musical life. And so I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how you've approached, I guess, what you want your creative outlook output to look like and how you factor that into this need to also pay the bills in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I, it's a, that's another great question. And I can real, it really resonates with me because I, I, I can always tell when I feel like my creative output output is, uh, is not great enough, um, in terms of like quantity or the amount of creativity I'm putting forth. Um, you know, for instance, on my YouTube channel, Last year, I started this series called Loop of the Day, and it was just a way of forcing myself to cr actually make music as opposed to just teach people how to make it. So it was a, a nice way of combining the educational aspects of, you know, this is how this chord works or this chord progression, uh, but doing it in the context of me actually making something. Uh, so I got to get the best of both, both worlds there. I'm creating, but I'm also teaching, um, doing and teaching, right? So... I have a I have a keen sense of awareness as to when I need to be more creative and when I've sort of become stale too stale for my own liking. I, I don't want to go too far down the the kind of business side of things, but we we had an interview recently with Elisa Johnson Jones of the Music Ed Mentor podcast, and one really interesting element that came out of that conversation was how valuable the entrepreneurial skill set can be to any musician. And you touched on it yourself there where, you know, if you want to make a living with music, you are essentially saying I'm starting a business, even if that's not how culturally we're raised to think about it. And so I'd love to hear any resources or lessons or attitudes or philosophies you've kind of incorporated to help you adopt that business persona as well as I am a creative musician. Yeah, I think the the number one thing for me was at some point I realized okay, if I'm going to think of this as running a business, then I have to look at how other businesses are run. So what I started thinking about was how are businesses run? You have the chief executive officer, you have the chief marketing officer, you have the head of sales, you have a creative director, you have all these different positions. And if you're running your own business, you have to basically fill those different chairs. So that's, that's how I approach it. I decided, okay, I got to learn a little bit about marketing. I got to learn a little bit about sales. I already had the creative officer sort of role figured out because that's what my education was. It was how to be creative in music. Um, but uh, those other positions, you know, learning how to handle your finances. Yes, at some point you can hire people to do this, but if you're doing a one-man show, you need to, you know, at least have a little bit of know-how to, to get by and to be successful. And is there any clash between, you know, you playing the role of chief marketing officer and you playing the role of chief creative officer? You know, there, there's really varied opinions out there about whether this is the best or the worst time to try and succeed in music in terms of finding listeners and making a living with it. How, how do you think about that in, you know, reconciling getting your music out there and getting paid for it versus I'll make the music I want to make? Yeah, well, one, one thing that I read a while back that stuck with me for, for a long time is this article that was uh, referred to me from, I think, uh, Tim Ferriss. Uh, it's like, it's this guy, Kevin Kelly wrote this article called 1000 True Fans. And in a nutshell, he talks about how if you can get 1000 true fans, like 1000 super fans who are willing to actually spend money on you, um, whether it be maybe 10, you know, hundred, let's say a hundred bucks a month or a year, 
right? Yeah, if you have a hundred, if, if you have a, th- a thousand fans who are spending a hundred dollars a year on you, whether that be for courses or for music that you're making or for merchandise, whatever it is, then you're making a hundred thousand dollars by the end of the year, which is you know a respectable living, um, more than more than respectable. So, I guess the point there is, if you can get these, if you can get a thousand true fans, then you're you're good to go now. Maybe 20 years ago, this would be very difficult to do for a lot of people when the record companies are controlling the, uh, the industry and, and so forth. But now you have so much independence. You can put music out on the internet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where you have, you know, three, three billion people online and you have access to them. So, you know, at, at some point I was like, really discouraged because a lot of people, you know, like I said, these camps that I was going to or in, in music school, you'd hear a lot of discouraging things like it's really difficult to make a living in music. Nobody likes jazz anymore. Um, but when you think about the fact that there are 3 billion people online and you only have to get a thousand of them to support you, the odds are in your favor. And if you know how to leverage things like, you know, the internet, which I pretty much grew up with, um, it's uh, very possible to to make a living doing anything, really. I mean, even something as obscure as you know high level jazz theory, it's uh, it's possible to to do that because of uh, the access you have to the whole world. Terrific. And I wonder if you could give an example or two of where that's influenced you in terms of projects or decisions you've made. When has that idea of a thousand true fans helped you make a decision? I think it's helped me make decisions about not needing to pander to what I think was is going to be like a popular uh, way of thinking or a popular sound. Um, it can be really easy to try to people please and and make stuff that you think make stuff only for the reason that you think other people might like it. But when you realize that there are so many people out there who you know, if you like something and if you do it well, somebody else is going to like it too. And if you do enough work when it comes to getting your music out there, doing some promoting, learning a little bit about marketing and sales, you're going to find a thousand people out there who like what you do. It might not happen overnight, but it can certainly happen. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to be said for staying true to what you like and what you feel is good and the kind of art that you want to make or whatever it is that you want to do, even if it's super, super unique. Um, and oftentimes it's the unique stuff that goes the furthest. It's, you know, that concept of niching down where you really get specific and that way, you know, maybe there's going to be a lot of people out there who hate it, but you know, if you try to, what is the expression? If you, uh, try to please everybody, you're going to, you're not going to please anybody. So the, I think the same thing goes for music and for most things in life, really. So we've talked a bit about creativity there. And I know that some of our listeners who are songwriters or composers or starting a band that will have really resonated with them and they'll really have appreciated your perspective. At the same time, I know there are some listeners who don't consider themselves creative And one thing we often talk about here on the show is how improvisation is not uh, an out of reach skill only for the expert jazz musicians, for example. And you as a a jazz specialist yourself and a a sax player uh, have a ton of experience with improvisation. And I've particularly enjoyed some of your YouTube videos talking about how to approach improvisation. So I'd love if we could talk a little bit about creativity in that context and maybe some of the the more practical side of being creative in music. Absolutely. I'll begin by asking just the simple question of how do you think about improvisation in music? Um, and, and you can answer that in as, as a teacher or as a musician or as both. Yeah, I'll answer as both. Um, <laughs> the, the way I think about improvisation is basically just like any, any language where when you speak, you don't have an exact idea of what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. You just start talking and you say something that kind of gets at what you mean, hopefully. Improvisation is the same thing. You have an idea in your head and because you've practiced speaking so much previously to continue the analogy, you're able to communicate what it is you want to say musically. So to get a little bit less esoteric there, 
um, and, and talk about this in a more practical way. Let's say you learn, and I'll continue the, the analogy here with language because I do think it's helpful. Let's say you learn a bunch of vocabulary words uh, and, and the metaphor there is uh, vocabulary words uh, means like a, a lick, let's say. So you learn a bunch of licks and you start to in- integrate yourself uh, you start to in- integrate the language of music into your subconscious mind by maybe you're doing transcription, so you're transcribing these licks. Maybe you're doing transposition exercises, like I was discussing before, where you're really internalizing these licks. After a while, just like when you learn a new voc- vocabulary word, you force yourself to use it in a sentence, you force yourself to write it down and, and uh, use it in your writing, in your everyday speech. Uh, when you do that with your musical ideas, when you do that with licks, you force yourself to use them in a solo, you force yourself to use them in a composition, eventually those lines that you've practiced so much in so many different keys and so many different contexts, even if you've been forcing it, eventually those ideas come out organically. And that is when improvisation really starts to feel effortless and that you're just speaking like like I'm right like I'm speaking right now where I don't have to think about every single word and every single uh you know grammar rule or whatever it's just coming out naturally the same is possible for improvisation it takes a lot of time a lot of the the struggles and the challenges arise because well when we learned language when we learned to speak our native native language it was at a very young age when we just kind of soak up the information and we don't need to think about grammar or or spelling or anything like that. We just kind of learn to speak by figuring it out. When most people learn to improvise, it's later on in life when they don't have that same uh, neuroplasticity or or whatever you want to call it. So you do need to really spend a little bit more time learning learning how to improvise, just like when you're learning any language, any second language. You you need to... uh, um, they say when, you know, the best way to learn a language is to put yourself in, in the country of, the, of where that language was spoken. And that's because that immersion is so effective. And if you immerse yourself in music, if you're always practicing, if you're always transposing, if you're always listening and transcribing and playing with other people, the music will start to come out of you organically. And that's an amazing feeling when you just suddenly have musical ideas kind of come to the surface out of nowhere, it seems. Uh, and then you're able to Uh, play them because you have that connection with your instrument. I'll say one more thing. Improvisation is just composition, but you do it spontaneously. So just like to improve your speaking, you can practice writing. To improve your improvisation, you can practice composing. Uh, So spontaneous composition is is also a, a very, I think, useful way of thinking about improvisation. Terrific. That that was a really well put explanation and i wonder if i could ask you a bit more on something you touched on there which is kind of you're internalizing all of this vocab and now it's in you in some sense and so when the time comes to improvise you bring it out can you shed any light on what for you or what you think should be the mental process for making that happen like is it an ear thing is it a music theory intellectual thing is it pure instinct and what, what does that look like once you've internalized this vocab yeah ideally it's an ear thing however in order for it to become an ear thing sometimes we need to rely on theory to help us get there so when i was talking before about transposing exercises and how that helps internalize something in your ear that's kind of what i'm talking about now where if you use theory to help you get there, eventually it's going to make whatever it is you're practicing is going to make its way into your ear. Um, another thing you can do to help that process along is by actually singing. Even if you're not a singer, if you're just you know a, an instrumentalist, uh, by singing you also help internalize musical ideas in your in your ear, and um, you also make it clear when you don't actu- when you're not actually hearing something accurately. Because it's easy enough to, you know, put your fingers down on the piano or on the guitar or press keys on a saxophone and just kind of blow air and the the notes come out. But it's a lot like, I I was thinking about this um, yesterday, actually, talking about how if you were to, um, yeah, sure, you can use, you can use words, you you can say words that you don't understand and people are going to know you don't really understand them. So it's a similar thing. If you just push down your fingers and hope that it sounds good, you know, 
maybe it might work if you're lucky some of the time, but most of the time it's going to sound like you're BSing. Just like if you were to um, go to France, speak with a French accent, but just speak a lot of gibberish in a French accent, you know, it's not going to make any sense to anybody. So the same is true for music. And in order to really understand whether or not you are hearing something clearly, if you can sing it accurately, if you can sing each note very accurately, get the center of the pitch, then you can really confirm, okay, I, I do I do have this idea uh, and I can execute it clearly and accurately. Uh, if you cannot do that, then you need to slow down. You need to make sure you can sing your ideas and then um, you'll have a much better chance at having those ideas pop up organically. There's a really excellent video with Bill Evans. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can just search for like Bill Evans lesson or something like that. It's an interview that where he's sitting down at the piano and, and he's being asked these questions. And he does this demonstration of how if you approximate your improvisation, it's very clear that you're just basically BSing and, and it's not anything of substance. And then you play something much more simple, but it's much more clear and it's and substantial. And the difference is clear. And um, he probably talks about the same idea in a much more eloquent and succinct way than I just did. So I highly <laughs> recommend che checking out the Bill Evans video that's out there. Nice. We will put a link to that in the show notes. But I, I love, love, love that you recommended singing like that. It, it's such a powerful thing. And I 100% agree that if you can't sing it, you haven't really understood it by ear. And I'd almost wrap up the interview here just to make sure we sent everyone away to think carefully about that. Um, and if anyone is thinking, oh, but I can't sing, we'll, we'll have links in the show notes to past episodes where we've gone deep on that and, and shown you some ways you can get going with singing and singing in tune. I won't wrap up the interview, though, because, Jeff, there were a couple more things I wanted to pick your brains on. And one was this fantastic blog post you wrote, which we'll link to in the show notes, called Seven Things I Wish I Knew When I Started Playing Music. And I won't put you on the spot and ask you to reel off all seven, but there were a few that jumped out at me, and we can refer people to the, the full blog post for more. But I wonder if you could just speak to a few of these. One was that time matters more than pitches. Yes. I... Um... I saw this video with the bassist Victor Wooten. It was uh, an instructional DVD. And um, he does this little example, uh, this demonstration, where he plays every wrong note. Every, it was almost random in terms of the pitches, but he plays with such good rhythm and feel and phrasing that it sounds amazing. And if anybody has heard Victor Wooten, you know he's got an amazing feel and amazing phrasing and great rhythm. And uh, that really kind of drove the point home that if you have good time and good phrasing and good rhythm, you can get away with playing wrong notes. Unfortunately, especially the way music and jazz and improvisation is taught in a lot of places, the emphasis is placed on the notes, the pitches, the scales, the arpeggios, all that harmonic analysis. And that stuff is important. Don't get me wrong. However, you can play all the right notes you want. If your time and your phrasing and your feel and your rhythm suck, it's going to sound bad. So it doesn't go both ways. You can play the wrong notes with the good time and the good feel and the good phrasing and get away with it. It's going to sound pretty good, but you can't go the other way. You can't expect to play all the right scales and arpeggios and have bad time and phrasing and, and expect, expect it to sound good. It doesn't work that way. So... Um, I think of, you know, playing music, or improvisation, or whatever, in terms of a pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid, the biggest section, that's where the time and the phrasing and the rhythm uh, are. And then above that, uh, later on in the pyramid, is where I put those pitches and the scales and the arpeggios and all that. Such a powerful point. Yeah, that, that's something we emphasize in our approach to improvisation at Musical U. But you're 100% right that you know, when someone's learning to improvise, they go so quickly to, oh, what scale should I use? Or, you know, what do I play over this chord? And, you know, if you're playing whole notes every bar, no one's going to be listening. <laughs> um, but as you say, you know, if you play the single pitch, but an awesome groove, you're going to catch people's attention. Um, so the second one was anticipate the chord changes. What do you mean by that? So I learned about anticipating chord changes from uh, one of my teachers in in music school, Jerry Berganzi, this uh, tenor saxophonist, amazing educator, ma amazing player. And what he had me do was 
anticipate chord changes. So basically, let's say you're playing a blues in, in B flat. So you have a B flat seven for four bars, and then you have the E flat seven. The idea is to start playing a line that would fit on E flat seven before the E flat seven hits. And this has a, a really cool musical effect where there's a little bit of tension. And then once the harmony catches up, everything kind of resolves and it sounds really good because you have that tension and release. But another effect I found is that when you are thinking ahead, not just for a musical advantage, but you're, at, you're also um, preparing your mind to be able to execute the chord uh, accurately or uh, and appropriately. So even if you don't start musically anticipating the chord, you'll have an idea, okay, I know this chord's coming up. It's not going to catch me off guard when it does hit so that when E flat seven, to use that blues example, comes back around or comes uh, comes up, I'll be ready for it and I won't be caught off guard. That's sort of the, the crux of the issue. You don't, especially when you're playing a fast tune with difficult changes, by the time the next chord comes up, it's already gone and you lost your chance to nail it. So by anticipating the chord changes, by thinking ahead, uh, you're, you're going to be better able to uh, execute and, and be able to navigate those changes in a way that is um, musical and, uh, and effective. Super cool. Yeah, I, I love that for a few reasons. The first is that I think it's one of those really simple concepts that can actually really kind of give you a little leap forwards in how good your improv sounds. But I think it's also because it kind of blends those two worlds of rhythm and pitch and and creates a looser feel of what should I play over this chord? You know, you're still thinking that through, but you're not feeling like, and now it's this chord, I'll just do these notes. And now it's this chord, I'll just do these notes. Like, I, I think it gives you a, one step more sophisticated an appreciation of the melody harmony interplay. Um, but it's such an easy thing for people to try out. You know, if you're used to playing over the chord changes, just try, you know, stretching that boundary a little like Jeff recommends. Absolutely. And, and, and I'll just, a, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but you were making me think like one, one other uh, benefit of doing that anticipation is especially on tunes where the changes are a little bit uh, unusual, like maybe like um, a jazz tune, like moments notice or stable mates where you have two fives that are moving, you know, chromatically, where if you do, like you were saying, play in a very vertical fashion when you're playing, okay, I'm playing in, on this key and in, in this 2-5 here, and then I'm switching abruptly to this key and this 2-5, there's nothing connecting. It's very vertical as opposed to horizontal. And when you, when you anticipate chord changes, it doesn't sound so abrupt when you go to the next chord change. It's, there's some, it's like voice leading in a way. It's like there's some common tones between the two chords. Even if they're not technically notes that would work on the, the previous chord, by forcing it, it, it does connect the two uh, harmonic um, areas in a way that makes it feel really natural when you go from one key to the next. So if you have difficult changes, try anticipating those chord changes so that it's, it feels much more horizontal as opposed to just vertical. Awesome. And the third one that jumped out at me that I, I couldn't not ask about because it's such a great heading was secrets of sight reading. And, you know, that's a hot topic for a lot of our listeners who maybe struggle with traditional notation or feel like they just can't get fast enough. Um, what, what would be your recommendations there? Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into good sight reading and, and I didn't learn these lessons or a lot of them, I just kind of figured them out out of some trial and error. Um, but sight reading is, is always a real challenge um, especially for me, but what I found, what I think helps quite a bit are a few things. One, again, the time is going to be more important than the notes. So get into the habit of, if you make a mistake, don't just stop and, you know, restart that measure or go back to the beginning because in a real life situation, if you're sight reading a tune or a chart with a band and you make a mistake, they're not going to stop for you. If you make a mistake, so you have to keep going. So you want to get into the habit of not losing the time. A nice exercise to help you get into the habit of this is playing a measure and then resting a measure, playing a measure and then resting a measure. And this will get you in the habit of letting the time go forward, regardless of whether you're playing or not. Um, and it keeps your eyes moving along the page. Cause if you make that mistake and your eyes are suddenly locked on where you made the mistake, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting back to where everyone else is. You want to get in the habit of keeping that, uh, forward momentum. Sorry to interrupt, but just to clarify, you're talking about playing a bar and then 
letting the music continue as it were but you're maybe imagining it in your head before you come back in mm-hmm. so you can sing the gotcha. you can sing it in your head where you're resting or you can just let the time go by it's just to get into the habit of not feeling like you need to be uh you know getting every single note right um because in fact the time and keeping the time going is more important than nailing every single note right the beat moves on with or without exactly you. <laughs> yeah well said um so another thing that is really effective when it comes to sight reading is chunking information. So this concept of chunking is pretty popular in uh, in and how to learn. It's uh, it's the the concept of taking little bits of information and combining them into larger chunks, so that your brain has a little bit more free space to process things. So for instance, if you have a G, a B, a D, and an F in succession. Rather than seeing four different notes, four different pieces of information, you can say, okay, look, it's GBDF. That's a G7 arpeggio. So suddenly your brain is able to chunk four pieces of information into one, and that's just going to free up your, your mind space to look at the next phrase. And, and what I do oftentimes is if, I, if I'm handed a new piece of sheet music is I'll just take a look through and just look. If I, if I can find any patterns right off the bat, any sort of arpeggios or scales, maybe I'll circle them just to you know, kind of remind myself, okay, this here is an arpeggio for this chord, or this here is a scale. And, and this is where knowing theory can be really helpful because the more scales you can recognize, like if you see, oh, it's a pentatonic scale, or oh, it's an augmented scale, or a diminished scale, like if you can put those labels on it, uh, that's going to really help you organize the information in a way where it's chunked together and it's not just going to be a million notes on the page. Um, last but not least, just practicing, you know, like anything else, you have to be familiar with just like those uh, arpeggios that I was uh, talking about, uh, rhythms. You know, you, you see the same rhythms come up again and again. And the more you practice sight reading, the more you're going to recognize those rhythms. It's, uh, it does take time. It's difficult, but uh, I hope that those tips are helpful in, in some way. <laughs> they are for me, at least. They, they, did, they did help me, so tried and true. Fantastic advice on sight reading. And you mentioned there practicing, and I'd love if we may to wrap up by talking again about practicing. And in particular, you have a piece of advice in an article on your blog about how to practice effectively that I just thought was so, so important for people to factor in. Um, So I wonder if you could share with us what is the secret to practicing effectively? Yeah, I think the, one of the, one of the best ways to approach practicing is to think of it, think of it like, um, I, I like to, I like to think of a balance beam. So you have a gymnast on a balance beam and, uh, if they fall off the balance beam, everyone knows it's very, very clear. So where am I going with this? Well, I like to create exercises for myself and for my students where it's very, very clear when they fall off the balance beam. And the reason for that is I want them to know when they've made a mistake. Instead of falling into the trap of just kind of noodling around, sort of aimlessly playing, uh, maybe they're working on an exercise, but then they kind of get distracted and they start going on to something else. If you have focus to the point where you're able to realize when your attention has wandered, or to go back to my balance beam analogy, to the point where you, where you fall off the balance beam, focus is the most important thing, right? And if you lose focus on an exercise that you're working on, you're not going to be making the most out of your time. One thing you can do to improve focus is thinking about practicing like meditation, where basically with meditation, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, you are focusing on your breath. As soon as you realize your focus wanders away from your breath, you bring your focus back to your breath. It's as simple as that. It's like you realize you, you're, you're not thinking about what you're supposed to be thinking about, so you bring your attention back to where you're supposed to be uh, thinking. And, and it doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. It doesn't, you don't have to bring emotion into it. You don't have to like beat yourself up over the fact that you started thinking about what you want for lunch later in the day. It's just, okay, I got distracted. Now I'm coming back. But if you don't realize that you got distracted, you're never going to be able to bring yourself back. So that's why the practice of meditation is actually really useful for practicing music because 
if you're able to become aware of the fact that you're thinking about lunch, then you can stop thinking about lunch and start thinking about your exercise that you're supposed to be working on. Now, what I was talking before about the exercises and the balance beam and all that, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here. Let's say you're doing something with a metronome. So you're practicing something with the metronome. And then um, you, you have the metronome on beats two and four. So it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you're working on the time exercise, let's say. And uh, it's kind of tricky. Like uh, sometimes you might mess up and now the metronome suddenly shifted to beats one and three. Like uh, it, it fl you flip the beat in your head. So now it's one, two, three, four. And what happens is the metronome lets you know, oh, I've done something. I've, I've flipped the beat. I've fallen off the balance beam. Now I can get back on it and practice this exercise and, and try to do it correctly next time. Um, but if you don't have that awareness of the fact that you have uh, either made a mistake or your mind has wandered off, then you're, you're basically wasting a lot of time because uh, it's like spinning. It's basically like spinning your wheels. So to wrap that up, stay focused on what you're working on. Be aware of whether or not you're focused or not. And if you realize that you've lost focus, no big deal. Just bring your focus back to what you're supposed to be working on and get on with, uh, get on with practicing. That's, uh, that's all there is to it there. Awesome advice. That, that is something that can make such a transformational difference in the results people get, I think. You know, and I, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are in the situation I have been myself where you set aside the time for music practice but if you really stop and look at how you were spending that time, it's more like just playing around than practicing. And I think you're absolutely right that focus is such a critical part of that and setting yourself up in a way that you can really answer the question, was I focused or not? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure for anyone listening, it's clear at this point how much wisdom and insight is packed into Jeff's head and how generous he is with it. And I wanted to point you to something in particular on his website that you must go check out. Jeff, could you tell us what are musical truth nuggets? <laughs> well, musical truth nuggets are just a fun name for my, uh, basically my newsletter uh, in which I include some videos that I've, uh, that I've made, blog posts that I've written. It's just an, an easy way to get notified when I come out with new material and, and new teaching so that uh, it gets delivered directly to your inbox and you don't have to worry about searching it out um so that that can be found on my website there's a sign up form right on the home page of uh, jeff schneider so those are my uh those are the the weekly musical truth nuggets that i try to that i try to share with people nice well it's more than just myself on the team who has been enjoying those musical truth nuggets for a while now uh, so i would definitely recommend going to jeff schneider and signing up could you give people an idea of what else they'll find on your website and your youtube channel yeah, so my YouTube channel, I, I talk a lot about the stuff that we talked about today. Um, fortunately, I'm able to edit myself a bit more so I don't come off as long-winded. But uh, the, the YouTube uh, videos, as I said, uh, cover a lot, of a lot of different musical concepts and, and topics. And I try to get uh, involved with different visual representations of those concepts and topics. So it can be very clear and easy to understand. Um, also on my website, I have some courses, some guides that supplement and support the YouTube videos. So, um, you know, for instance, I have this chord scale chart. I call it the last chord scale chart you'll ever need because it, it has like every, it has everything and it's laid out in such a way where it's super easy to understand. And it's the kind of thing that I wish that I had when I was learning different scales and modes and, and arpeggios and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have some piano voicings that I call sick, uh, sick voicings, volume one, volume two is coming out soon. And, uh, in that I include really hip voicings for piano that are amazing for jazz and for gospel and neo soul and R and B. And, um, again, those are laid out in such a way that's kind of unique and it will help you when it comes to composing and reharmonizing. And it's, it's all the, all the voicings that I love to use in my own playing. Fantastic. And I, I hope Jeff is going to forgive me for saying something rude, which is that these courses on his website are massively underpriced for the value you get. They probably are. <laughs> so if you're imagining <laughs> spending a ton of money here, do check out his website, see if any of those courses appeal and then pick up a few because they are going to give you more musical truth nuggets and more insights and wisdom like Jeff's been kind enough to share today. 
all that remains is to say a big thank you, Jeff. That's been such a pleasure talking through these topics with you. And um, I really encourage everyone to check out your website, your YouTube channel and, and learn more. Thank you so much, Christopher. It's been a pleasure talking with you as well. Unlock your full musicality with Musical You membership. Find out more at musicalitypodcast.com forward slash join. So I was pretty confident that Jeff would live up to my expectations to drop some musical truth nuggets in this interview, and he certainly did. I'm sure you had a few aha moments in there. So let's recap and see if the same things jumped out to you as they did at me. Jeff grew up learning music by ear, on piano and then sax. He had a supportive family and musical environment at school, but it's clear he really had an internal drive to pursue music. He read Charlie Parker saying in an interview that he practiced 15 hours a day, and that actually inspired Jeff to know that hard work was what it took, rather than talent, where I think a lot of people his age would have just heard about all those hours of practice and run the other way. It sounds like Jeff had some pretty epic practice periods growing up, and was quickly focused on jazz, doing exercises to transpose licks into all 12 keys, something that's often mentioned in the world of jazz, but often underappreciated by players in other genres. I also thought it was cool to hear how useful he found this, given that he was more of an ear player, rather than the more theory or notation-based players who are often the ones recommending it. I asked Jeff about motivation along the way, and he said there were performances and competitions and so on, but really what inspired him to keep working hard at music was to play with his peers, people around his own age, and to see those who were a notch better than him, because that let him see what was possible next for him too. I think there's a valuable lesson there about being inspired by the greats, of course, but also taking motivation by seeing players just a bit better than you currently are. It's something we touched on in our past episode on teachers, coaches, and mentors, how actually your peers can serve a really useful mentor role, even if they're only a step or two ahead of you. As I noted in the interview, Jeff is remarkable for keeping his creative output alive while doing so much educational work, and I really admire that, so I was keen to find out how he manages it. It's cool the way he thinks about the different roles a business needs, and how he can cover each of them himself through studying up and paying attention to areas like marketing and finances, as well as the creative activities. The article he referred to, Kevin Kelly's 1000 True Fans, is pretty much required reading for modern entrepreneurs, but it was originally intended more for creatives like musicians, and I think it's getting increasingly recognised as something that basically everyone should read. So we'll have a link in the show notes, and you should check that out if you have any connection with the idea of how the internet has transformed the landscape for getting your ideas seen and heard by the people you want to reach. We talked about improvisation, and I really enjoyed hearing his way of thinking about it. As you would expect from a jazz musician, licks and vocabulary are front and centre, but he clearly wasn't talking about robotically reproducing the things you've memorised in advance. For him... It's about internalizing those musical ideas to the point where they come out naturally to let you express what you want to, just like learning vocabulary in a foreign language lets you speak your own unique sentences. I was delighted to hear him recommend singing as a crucial part of that learning process, because it's something we so keenly advocate here at Musical U, the power of singing for every musician, whether or not you consider yourself to be a singer. As I said, I'll link in the show notes to past episodes if you have any qualms about singing yourself, but assuming you're happy to try it, then definitely do take on board what Jeff said about singing things as you learn to play them, and singing musical ideas before trying to play them. That point that you haven't truly understood something in your ear, unless you can sing it back, is a really important one for accelerating your ear training. I asked Jeff to share a few of the seven things he wished he knew back in music school, and we'll link to that full blog post in the show notes, but he shared about three of them. Firstly, that rhythm matters more than pitch in music, and especially when it comes to improvisation. Hopefully hearing us talk that through, you could imagine and realise how true that is. In our own improv roadmap at Musical U, we have some cool exercises to help you explore those two dimensions independently of each other before combining them together, and that's something you can play around with right now today to improve your playing, both in improvisation and in general. 
The second thing was about anticipating the chord changes. This is a, a bit of a specific improv thing, but even if you're not studying hard on improvisation, I think it's an idea worth playing around with, because that interplay of melody and harmony is everywhere in music, and realizing that the music doesn't really care about the bar lines on the page, and those two elements go together, but perhaps not completely strictly. Those are powerful ideas to wrap your brain and your ears around. And the third lesson I asked Jeff to talk about was about sight reading, where he again came back to the idea that the rhythm of notes is more important than their pitches. When sight reading, you have to make sure you keep that beat moving steadily. And for that, he recommended an exercise of only playing alternate bars, for the other ones just keeping the beat going in your head. He also recommended learning to chunk the notes into groups based on patterns, so you can speed up your visual understanding of the notes on the page and leverage the patterns your fingers are already good at playing. And finally, he noted it comes down to practice, like everything else. As was pretty obvious from his backstory, Jeff is a musician who has put a lot of time into practicing, and a lot of thought into how to best use that time to maximize results. So it was cool to hear his top recommendation of focusing on focus. Truly, your practice time is wasted in direct proportion to how unfocused you are, and I'm a believer that to a large extent, the minutes of practice where you're not focused may as well not happen at all. There is perhaps some value in mindless repetition for developing physical technique, muscle strength, dexterity, and so on, but those are so rarely the things that are really holding us back in music. So having your mind fully present and your thoughts focused on your practice activity is really valuable advice to take on board. Jeff is continually publishing powerful insights and recommendations like these on his blog at jeffschneidermusic.com, as well as his YouTube channel, in courses, and via his email list. So do head to jeffschneidermusic.com, that's Schneider spelt S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R, jeffschneidermusic.com, and check out everything on offer. As always, we'll have direct links to everything we mentioned, including Jeff's sites, that Kevin Kelly essay, the past episodes of this podcast that were relevant, and more, all in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.